Good afternoon everyone and thank you for dialing in to today's webinar. Today we're going to be talking about the design and architecture industry in New Zealand and we're going to be moving through a fair bit of detail. So I'll say up front, uh, don't need to take any notes, sit down, kick back, listen, ask questions as we go, really happy to facilitate those. But uh, what we'll do at the end of today's session is we'll send you a link to the recording and we'll also send you a copy of the presentation. There's quite a bit of data to move through so I'd rather you guys ask as many questions as you possibly can and we'll just facilitate those throughout today's. So in terms of my background, my name is Narelle Stefanak, I'll be your host for today's session and I've been with SEEK for, this is my 11th year with SEEK, so if you guys haven't joined a training session before, welcome. Uh, before joining SEEK, I worked in the recruitment industry, so everything we're going to run through is going to have a very practical lens, so how do you use this data to be able to have more meaningful conversations with hiring managers? Because ultimately what we're trying to do is position you as a subject matter expert so that when you're going into these conversations, taking a job brief, you have a lot more influence because you're using independent data from whether it be the MBIE, Careers NZ or from SEEK to be able to really influence and control that relationship between the hiring manager and the candidate to make sure that we get the best placement, the best outcome as fast as possible. So in terms of the content that we're going to run through, um, I'll show you what that looks like in a moment, but uh, if you do want to take questions or, or facilitate questions today, can you type them into the question box for me? We've just got a few of you on the line, so I'd prefer you guys just to type them in. If you haven't found this little red box with a white arrow, click on it, and then that'll open up this area. Type away, I'll answer as many questions as we can. Now we have run a number of these before and design and architecture is a bit of a funny industry on SEEK because it covers everything from creative industries uh, through to construction and architecture, um, even some sort of web-based uh, when we're talking about web design and, and graphic design. So we're, we're going to talk about all of those uh, today, but if you sit more on one side than the other, so uh, we've already covered things like construction and engineering, perhaps you might want to get copies of those um, insights as well. Just let me know post today's session, email me and I'll make sure I send those through for you. Uh, we have also done obviously IT, so again, if you're sitting more in that web design, more IT and, and that UX design and architecture in the background, then perhaps you'd want to get across what the IT insights are as well. So just let me know uh, what's coming up in 2015. We've still got a few more industries to cover. So we've got 30 classifications on SEEK. The next ones will drop in uh, throughout the rest of the year. So if you're interested in these, also let me know. I'll send you an invite. All right, so today what we're going to do is we're going to break this into a few different sections, but we're going to move through information pretty damn quickly. So the first thing we're going to look at is some independent insights into what's been happening in the employment category for design and architecture across about nine different occupational groups and they're broken across those three different areas of creative IT and, and uh, construction, so that building construction area. And just have a look at what's been going on in that employment sector over the last couple of years. And then we'll also look at where you can get this independent data from yourself so you don't have to just rely on the SEEK uh, webinars coming through, but also what are they projecting for the next few years, what does that marketplace actually look like? So we'll have a really good feel for what's actually going on in that category. Then we'll use the SEEK data to really analyse what's happening right now in real time because as much as the industry insights and the data that sits in there that's independent is really good, it's also a little bit dated. Uh, if they only sort of roll it up every couple of years. So we want to make sure that you're getting real time insights in terms of What's the supply and demand like, look like? So is it easy or hard to source for, for particular candidates? What sort of salaries are being offered out in the marketplace? And what sort of behaviours are we seeing from candidates? So we can start to map out how easy or difficult it might be to resource for particular roles. All right, let's jump into things. So the first thing we're going to look at is some information. It's come from originally from the MBIE, so the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment in New Zealand. And there's been a website called Careers NZ, which has done some rolled up findings. And I'm going to show you this website in a minute as we move through the data. But what I've done to sort of help us digest 
all the data that sits in there because there's quite a lot, uh, is I just really wanted to give you a bit of perspective around how the categories have moved. And I've split this because if you advertise in the classification design and architecture, you, you're probably sitting in one of these three buckets. You're either looking for someone that sits within the building and construction industry, in the creative design industry, or more in that IT web building capability. And what they've found uh, in New Zealand between 2010 and 2012 is that whilst building and construction have been, has been increasing quite strongly, um, the IT web design has actually seen a little bit of a drop off, but it's off a very low base. Okay, on the right hand side of the screen, you can see it's, it's relatively flat to be honest. I mean, the numbers are so small uh, that it, it's very difficult to gauge uh, the actual increase or decline. Um, but it, all in all, we, we've definitely seen a little bit of movement across each of those categories. What's really interesting is what Careers NZ is predicting to happen. And so what I've done is I've gone into each of these occupational groups individually. And you can see the ones in blue, they all sort of relate to more that building construction and design segment. And then the ones in pink are, are more of the creative design. And then the green is the web design. And I know that um, you know graphic design would probably map into a little bit of the IT space as well. So you know they're just being categorized that way just to help you move your eye through which bit's going to be most relevant for you. But all in all, the commentary that Careers NZ has been providing is that demand is increasing. Okay, the only areas where we've definitely seen strong demand ongoing and it's going to continue that way is actually in clothing design. Um, it's just that there's 95% of companies have said that they're finding it moderately to extremely difficult to fill skilled positions. Um, everyone else is seeing increasing decline due to either uplifts in construction um, based off you know the activities that's been happening in residential and commercial areas for um, across Canterbury and also Auckland um, so the other stuff that we're seeing is that there's even though there might be increased demand for some categories there's an oversupply of graduates so areas like interior design uh, and I think it's web design as well um, there, there's actually a healthy supply of candidates that are sitting there to take on these these more grassroots roles so looking for senior or skilled staff may be more of the challenge uh, than necessarily the the entry-level staff but I'll leave this with you to read at your own time if you haven't already. Uh, what I will show you though is how you can access this information yourself whenever you want it. I've put in here the link anyway that you can access later on, so careers.gov.nz forward slash jobs. And what that looks like, if I move to it here, you should see it on your screen in a second, is you get this jobs database and they have about 400 different roles listed in here and they've clustered them under some industry groupings which are different to our classifications but they make sense so you can either look across an industry and then break it out and, and look deeper into it so if you're in construction and infrastructure you sort of could go through a whole range of different breakdowns and the other thing you can do is just type in so if you were looking for someone say a graphic designer if you start typing, it has this uh, autocomplete, so it's called query intent, so it understands what you're trying to get to, and it prompts you with, well, which one do you want? And let's say I want a graphic designer, so I clicked on that one. Don't hit search for some reason. They've got like a little bug in their system. As soon as you hit the search button, it goes crazy and it gives you all these hyperlinks. Uh, just wait for it to load. And then once you're in here, it's actually built for a candidate. Okay, so you need to sort of put your hiring manager lens on and think, okay, well, what does that information mean to me? But it gives you this nice little slice between, okay, well, graphic designers that are that entry level, one to five years, this is their pay level, versus a more senior designer that has five years plus, this is their pay level. And so that's a quite a neat little one to have. So if you're talking to hiring managers and they want someone with more than five years experience, but they're not willing to pay any more than 50K a year, well, you can use this okay, as leverage to be able to say, well, we may need to be more competitive than that because Designers Institute of New Zealand has reported that they get paid anywhere between 55 to 75K if they're experienced. So you either need to think about taking someone who has less experience or perhaps maybe move the dial on your salary expectations. 
It also gives you this historical lens, which I showed you in that sort of graph. Um, I did the rolled up clustering, but this is just a year on year increase in employment numbers. So you can see that it's gone from 6,282 up to 6,421 people over the last couple of years. And it also tells you again where they get it, that information from. So any piece of information that's interesting to you, they'll usually provide you with the source and that way you can always go back and do further investigation if you like to. When they talk about job opportunities, the thing I like about this one is you can click on it and it will take you into another landing page and actually talk about uh, why they think job opportunities are going to be average. Okay, so although job numbers are increasing, competition for vacancies is high. So even though the job numbers are going up, there's a lot of candidates out there that want them. There's a big appetite. So it's just finding that balance. So companies may be able to have a little bit of fluidity around who they pick and choose. And, you know, that real speed to candidate may not be as big an issue because there may be a healthy supply of those candidates. But the more niche they become, so if they're looking for someone with a particular skill set, with particular um, depth of experience, then they're going to have to speed up their process. Uh, it goes through a range of different um, uh, areas where there is strong competition. So it talks about the different areas and different skills that candidates themselves should be focused on developing. So if you're sitting and facing a candidate and they're not quite right, this can give you some ammunition to say, well, look, this is what you need to focus on. This is probably what you need to develop to get you to the next level. Now, if you also get, say, you're a recruitment agency and you get the role and uh, they haven't given you a job brief, right? They've just said, you should know what a graphic designer does, go out and recruit for it. Then often building out the duties and the tasks in the body of the ad can be a little bit more onerous if you're not familiar with the industry. But if you click on the About the Job tab, it does come down and talk about tasks and so what you will do and skills and experience. So again, this could help you frame out or even have that conversation with the hiring manager to say, hey, do you need them to analyze requirements um, of the project with clients? Yes. Okay. Well, who are those clients? How big are they? How many clients do they have a set portfolio? Or do they need to develop it? So you can start to ask questions based on some of these key tasks here as well. So I really love navigating through this independent site. Um, you can see that the data is a little bit dated. Okay, it's from 2010 to 2012. It takes them a long time to actually update these because there's so many individual categories. Uh, but I would expect that new data should be coming into it this year. So I'd keep an eye out for it and just keep an eye on, you know, what's the new sets of data that are coming through uh, to make sure you're up to date. All right, I'm going to move back to the presentation. What we're going to do now is, now that we understand sort of some of the movements within those categories and where you can get that information from, how do we apply real-time supply and demand insights over it? So we can put even more pressure on those hiring managers to make really well-informed decisions. Okay, because there's nothing worse than you taking a job brief where they say, you know what, we want this unicorn. We want this perfect candidate and we know they're going to be bloody hard to find, but that's what we, we want to set the task for you as. And they send you off on a wild goose chase only for you to spin your wheels, not find them, and then come back and have to start again. Okay, what we want to do is sort of have a good, robust conversation at the beginning to say, well, what you're expecting does not exist. And what we need to do is round out what your expectations are and what you're going to be flexible on. And that's when you use some of this supply and demand data to do that. So the way that we measure supply and demand is we look at the volume of jobs. We look at the engaged candidate supply, so candidates who are active and passive that are looking at those job ads. And then we then capture the real-time supply and demand by average applications per ad. Okay, so the apply behavior. And the reason why we capture it there is because it tells us how easy or difficult it might be for you to be able to source an application. And what we do is we don't publish absolute application numbers just for competitive reasons, but we index it. Okay, so this is a real index. So if you think urban design and, and planners get an average of one application per ad, then architecture, they may get three. And then fashion and textile designers may get six. Okay, so you can sort of see the scalability of it right through to graphic designers, which gets plenty. So you'll start to be able to rationalize uh, how easy or difficult it might be to resource. Now, what we've highlighted here are the three 
really problematic areas because we have very low average applications per ad. So if you have a hiring manager that's, say, looking for an architect, then this would be a perfect opportunity to say, well, look, architects are the second most in-demand or second most difficult role to resource for across New Zealand. So how flexible are you going to be? Okay, so that would be your first part in just having the dialogue. The other thing that you might want to think about is, well, how am I actually going to go about sourcing these candidates? Okay, so we might know that architects are going to be really tricky to find. So do we just advertise? or should we be searching for talent as well? So SEG gives you the capability as part of your contract to do both. Okay, you don't have to pay for the search capability. If you guys aren't using talent search, then definitely flag that with me post this session. I'll make sure you're aware of it and how you access it. But basically, the moment your ad goes live, within seven seconds, what we do is we return. We basically grab your ad, use the data out of it, search through our 3.2 million candidates, and then return a list of candidates to you that sits in our talent search platform that you can just navigate your way through, refine, and try and find that needle in a haystack. Okay, there's heaps of really cool refinement capabilities, but it's free. So when you post your ad, you should be using those two things in conjunction. Um, so this is where I would be using them immediately. Whereas on the flip side, when you look at graphic designers, industrial design, there's ample supply. So maybe a job ad alone is serving its purpose for you. You know, if you're getting stung with lots of irrelevant candidates, well, then that's when I'd use Talent Search again because you want to take control back. You don't want to just see the ones that are applying to you. I'd go in and I'd try and find that perfect candidate and just reach out to those ones. So really thinking about how you're going to go about your sourcing strategy by using this chart will be really influential. Now, the other thing that we look at is if these are the three most difficult roles to resource for nationally, where are they? Okay, because you might be in Wellington looking for an architect, but the lion's share of those candidates aren't there. Okay, so if we have a look at this next graph, what you can see is that the lion's share of people looking for architectural roles are either looking in Auckland or in Canterbury. So you'd say to your hiring manager, that not only are they the second most difficult role to resource for nationally, the lion's share of candidates aren't here. Would you be willing to target candidates out of Canterbury or Auckland? You know, would you be willing to pay relocation costs? Would you pay sign-on bonuses to get them to move here? What would you do to be able to make this happen? Because as much as we'll try and capture candidates from the local market, if we're unable to do that, then what would you be willing to do? And this is where you create a little bit of flexibility in your job brief from the moment you take it. And you can sort of see these are the three most trickiest ones. You know, the supply across these areas is, is pretty lean. So I'd definitely be using the talent search mechanism to be able to broaden that up. Okay, work out where these candidates are. The good part about talent search as well is you can say, um, even though your job might be listed, say, for an architect in Wellington, you can say, show me candidates who are living here, but also show me candidates who are willing to relocate to Wellington. So that helps you. You're not just targeting people in Auckland willy-nilly. They may be happy there. They may not want to move. Uh, but people, if they've indicated that they want to move to Wellington, you'll have access to those as well. All right, so if we understand where they are, are we going to be competitive enough with our salary offerings? And this was sort of flagged when we looked at the Careers NZ stuff. Okay, if we're looking for a graphic designer, it's really split into two levels, that sort of entry level with minimum experience and then a more senior level with a lot more experience and the pay differential is quite substantial. So you need to make sure that you're going to be competitive with not only what people are actually getting paid but with what the market's offering. So we don't capture what people are actually getting paid, we capture the market offering. Okay, when you guys plug in your minimum salary and your maximum salary band, we publish those. And this is what we come up with. Okay, so what you can see here is that the minimum salary is 81000 to 105000 for urban design and planners. Okay, so if you're not sitting within that range, you may find it very difficult to be able to compete for the talent in that pool. And again, that's where you would brief in that hiring manager. Same with architecture. It's anywhere between 71 to 87. So are we going to be competitive? If you're only willing to pay 70K, we're probably not going to be competitive. Can you move the dial on your offering? Or what else do you do? 
do you provide parking? Do you provide any allowances? Do you provide any equipment gear? Do you, what do you do that helps these candidates from a financial perspective so that we can really promote that because we may struggle when we look at just the, the salary alone? All right, so that's how you would use some of that data in terms of influencing the hiring manager. When you get around to posting your ad, you also want to consider what are they actually going to do? What is that candidate experience going to look like? And one thing that I can tell you is that it's most likely going to involve some sort of interaction on a mobile device. Okay, 47% of traffic is now via a mobile device. So we want to make sure that whatever content you're creating works exceptionally well on desktop and on mobile. Now, if you haven't looked at your ads in a mobile environment before, just do it. Get in there, search for one of your ads, see what the com competitors look like, um, have a look at how it renders on the screen. Would you choose your little summary to click on and move through to the body of the ad? If you would, fantastic. Uh, when you're looking at the body of the ad, how does it feel? Do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel like it's going to take a lot of time to digest all the information you have? Or do you feel like it's really well structured? You can clearly see what each piece of information is going to contain. Okay, so it's, it's well structured on the page and you can move through it really easily and you understand it really quickly. Okay, we just want to make sure that that whole user experience is going to be really useful. The other thing we need to consider is click apply. Now, if the application process, and complete the application, you know, put it in as a test, it's your own company so you'll know it'll be fine, but if you test out the application process and you feel it's really hard from mobile, then that's something that I think needs to go onto your strategic agenda for 2015 because come next year, mobile will dominate and candidates will expect that you have a mobile solution for the application. So in Australia, to give you perspective, it's 59% of all of our traffic is via mobile and more than 30% complete applications that way. Now, the only reason why application numbers is lower is because a lot of companies still haven't built out their mobilised application process. So if you can do it and you can be one of the first front runners to have a really great, slick, seamless mobile application process, you're definitely going to be miles ahead of your competitors. Now, when we look at what they actually click on and what they don't click on when they search, probably the three biggest things that we notice is that they will use a location. Location is really important. Okay, I want to look in my area, and then I'm going to refine it in some way, other or form. You know, so and all these numbers don't add up, and that's because they'll do several things when they search. But keywords really interesting. It's about seventy percent now, and. When they use keywords, it typically skews towards a job title most of the time, but for the design and architecture industry, it does sort of slice around a bit because it's so broad. So we see job titles featuring, we also see skills featuring as well, ARCHICAD, CAD, AutoCAD, Graphic Design, Revit, you know, you can start to see that these skills are becoming more and more important for them to be able to find the most appropriate roles. So the key thing to think about is when you write your ads, don't worry about keyword loading them. Okay, You don't have to bolster them up. You don't have to put lots and lots of keywords in just to match with candidates. What we do is we say, does the keyword exist, yes or no? And that's pretty much it. right? If the keyword exists, fine, you get a point. If the keyword doesn't exist, you don't get it. If the keyword exists 20 times the same keyword, you still only get one point. Okay, because what we're saying is, does it exist, yes or no? We don't care how many times it's there. As long as we have a match, you know, the candidate doesn't need to read ARCHICAD 20 times to know that it's relevant for them. They only need to read it once. So don't need to worry about really putting in lots and lots of the same term. But what I would think about is, are we using the most appropriate job titles? You know, are our job titles relevant just to us or to this company? Or are they relevant to candidates in the marketplace? Because candidates use job titles that are common, ones that make sense, or they're functional. Okay, so graphic designer, simple. You don't need to call them the chief executive designer in charge of layout. Okay, so <laughs> you don't need to go over the top. What we're trying to do is use terms that candidates would actually understand and go, yep, that sounds like me, I'm a graphic designer, I'm in. And you could have senior graphic designer, graduate graphic designer, graphic designer, and you could put in um, a specialty that they may have. So I'm not sure what else goes with graphic designer. Maybe they need to have um, HTML5 
um, capability because I'll be designing for um, for mobile environments. So you know that sort of stuff I would put in. So they're your keywords, and I guess in terms of wrapping this all up for you, I really want you to walk away with a sense that you have a really good perspective of what's happening in that macro environment, what's actually going on, where the candidates are, what the market's been like, what the market looks like it's going to be in the future, based on that independent data and commentary from the MBIE and Careers NZ, and you can tap into it. They've got 400 occupations in there. If I haven't covered your occupation today, by all means, go in and isolate it out. Yourself, but you know where to go and you know where to get that from. And then the other things to overlay with that is the seek insight. So, how easy or difficult will these candidates actually be today to resource for based on their application rates? Are they going to be in low supply, high supply, and how would we tailor our sourcing strategy as a result? How would we change the conversations that we have with hiring managers to get them to be more flexible, to get them to give you more robust information that you can actually use in your ads? And then really manage that hiring manager's expectations. Okay, so if you have all of this knowledge, you'll be able to push back on hiring managers that are setting, you know, this unicorn brief where you're, you're trying to find that needle in a haystack that just may not exist. So you can really position that quite well with hiring managers because you've got so many different data sources to back you up. It's not you just saying it on gut feel, which if you've been working in this industry for a while, you'll have a really clear idea of where the candidates are and how easy or difficult they may be and what sort of salaries should be offered. But people believe hard, cold facts, not just gut feel all the time. So combine your expertise, your existing expertise, with some really good, robust data. And then finally, think about the way you're sourcing. A lot has changed in the last few years. The marketplace has definitely evolved to be more transparent. So it's not just about posting an ad and then waiting for the talent to apply and hoping and praying they apply to you and not someone else. It's actually about taking that control back. How do you actually get greater transparency over it? Do you know what candidates want? You know, in that talent search environment, candidates tell you how much money they want, where they're willing to work, how flexible they'll be, whether they could be tempted or actively looking. So they give you a lot of really rich information. They also supply all of their profile data, which is a summary up of their CV and they supply their CV as well. So use the two to really build out a faster mechanism for talent sourcing. Guys, thank you so much for your time today. If you have any questions, feel free to type away now. Otherwise, we'll leave it there. And thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks, guys.